Okay, thank you all so much for coming and joining us this evening. I'm Jackson, Community Engagement Officer at the Your Shore Beach Rangers Project. But, um, it's a partner project with Cornwall Wildlife Trust and Cornwall College. We are one of 31 Arbright Future Projects funded by the National Lottery Community Fund and this is part of our community training programme. And we have another two sessions coming up next Tuesday, the 16th of January, the 19th of January and then the 26th of January, sorry, the 19th and the 26th of January. Um, and we may have other training programmes coming up um, and we have other events happening. So do keep an eye on our social media and sign up to our newsletter. Um, this evening, um, we have a presentation from our youth engagement officer, the very lovely and wonderful Jem Sandiford. Um, if you do have questions as we go along, please do feel free to put them in the chat and I will keep an eye on them for you. Um, and are you ready to go, Jen? Right, thank you. Yes, I am ready. I will share my screen. Uh, but yeah, as Jack said, thank you for coming. Obviously, with it being a smaller group than planned, we might get through it slightly quicker. Um, but there is a little bit of um, sort of interaction I'd like to have, obviously. So um, I know, Jeremy, you turn your camera off. But if you, yeah, if you don't mind turning it back on when we're, we're having a natter, that would be lovely. But no pressure if you don't want to, obviously. Um, so today is just about uh, working with young people. Um, obviously, I am the Youth Engagement Officer of the Osho Beach Rangers Project. And my name is Jen, and hopefully this will work. There we go. Right. I don't need to go through this because Jack's just did then. Um, but as Jack said, I'm really happy to take questions throughout and there will be a chance of sort of more of an open conversation. And the chance starts now. So why don't we engage with more young people is my first question. So what do we think stops us doing that? Any thoughts? Feel free to just unmute yourself. <laughs> uh, not knowing how to engage, you know, not knowing what interests them, maybe Jen or something like that, what's interesting and fun for them. So not knowing like what to target them with. And what were you going to say, Janine? Uh, yeah, I, I was actually, yeah, I'm glad Jeremy <laughs> said it. I was going to say something like that. Um, I, th I think it is. I think it's it's not knowing and not knowing how to reach young people. Like we often go through schools and and that's it, it can sometimes be a barrier as well as a way through because it depends whether the teachers have got the time to sort of share. And and then there's also maybe some safeguarding issues that maybe feel like, oh, I feel a bit uncomfortable kind of being one on or in a group with young people. How do I go about that? that yeah. kind of yeah no that's cool and those were kind of things I suspected as well. and I know the things that we've that have sort of been raised as well previously during the conferences um so hopefully this tonight will sort of clarify some of that they do talk about that sort of engaging um ready-made group as opposed to sort of community based young people if that it'll make sense as we progress through so why should we be so Obviously, that is a question. Um, in fact, I'm going to take that away and say, why do you guys, why do you think we should be working with young people? Why does it matter? I, I think from, from my point of view, they are a section of our population and we miss an awful lot if we don't, as, as a council, if we don't engage with um, young people. Um, we, yeah, yeah, we're missing a huge, a huge part of of that of that picture yeah yeah I'm, I'm, I'm a parent as well so i think it's you know important that i can relay stuff to to my own children as well um about what we were going to talk about and i also think that they're the ones that are going to look after us and they're the ones who potentially we can maybe allow the lay the foundations to something good and they can take it over so it's important that they they take that on board as well yeah yeah definitely jack that in <clears throat> and that on top of them you know being a part of the population it's it's another aspect of diversity you know you have various different diversities but diversity of age is just as important the more more of a diverse um audience you can engage with the more diverse views that you get and you might hear stories from them you might hear angles from them that you wouldn't have otherwise thought of um, and that's a really important way to address issues as well I think. 
there. I'm, I'm not doing like, yes, I agree. Of course I agree. That's what I've been doing. <laughs> I'm like, yes, I agree with everything. So yeah, no, totally. You know, we need to harness that power. Obviously, I think, for, you know, recently, young people have really shown themselves to to really care about the environment. And I know there's um, there's still almost like a stigma sometimes about wondering whether it's sort of cool to be environmentally minded. Um, but I think it is becoming more of a, a it sounds real, for a want of a better word, a cool topic. Um, you know, this was obviously taken from the um, strike in the centre of Truro. And it was incredible. Um, I don't know if anyone else managed to get across for that, but I know Jax did. It was it was so moving. And we need to harness that power. As you said, it's a you know, it's a another part of the population that, you know, we can't and we shouldn't ignore because they've got a lot to give. Um, so when we look at benefits, obviously, to the environment, things that we just sort of said then as well, including young people bring more young people. So if you can have a sort of younger looking project or a younger looking aspect of your projects they're more likely to be able to bring more young people to you even within our beach rangers we have one beach ranger josh who is a bit of a ringleader and if ever i need him to if ever the beach rangers are being a bit slow to respond to me i say josh will you give them a lot of poke and he does and then I've had emails back already because I've gone, Josh, can you speak to the rest of them? And, and that's, you know, if you've got that one that can sort of bring them in, then it's it's great. And it is, it's about enabling it. It's like Jeremy was saying, enable is to pass that torch to the next generation, because if it just stops, if it just stops, it will just stop. We need to carry on the sort of conservation message. Benefits for us, energy, time I mean energy I put that and I genuinely mean that I'm you know, mid-30s and by the time I finish my working day I'm shattered I want to sit on the sofa maybe have a beer and chill out do you know what I mean young people have more energy and they can bring that to the table and that's really refreshing time now that can be sometimes Sometimes it's beneficial. Sometimes they have a lot of lack of time, but then other time they have time on their hands, if that makes sense. Um, you know, they've got a lot of time constraints if, if they're studying or whatever. But then a lot of courses that they do, which we'll look at when we're sort of looking at ready-made groups, um, there is a, there is aspects of some courses that they should be going out doing volunteering um, and different things like that. Like Jax was saying, a fresh perspective, it's good to get a fresh set of eyes. You can get stuck in a rut and we're doing the same things over and over. And then you get a fresh perspective and, you know, it can open up a lot, lot more doors. A different skill set and creating those light bulb moments. And it's really rewarding. I think for anyone who's ever worked with young people, um, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a thing that we've spoke about a lot, me and Jax, when we've discussed different events that we've run you know um working with I think was it year eight from Polter school in St Austell and these were kids that some of them couldn't swim some of them had never stepped foot on the beach they were all varying levels of confident with the sea and it was a really fast-paced day we did about five snorkel sessions throughout the day getting the kids in the sea getting them out and as we were walking down to the beach there was another trainer, wasn't the Jets, who turned around to us and said, oh, you know, this is really hard work. So we were kind of dreading it. But once the day started, it was the most rewarding. It was still one of the most rewarding days I've done as part of this job, because those were kids that don't usually have access to such opportunities for sure. And we actually really made a difference to their day. And you know, you don't want to be all like, and to their lives, but you could tell that they loved it. It was, it was beautiful. And being able to do something like that and give something back to any young person, to anybody within the community, but in particular, when it's those young people that don't have the same access to those same opportunities, it's, it's incredibly rewarding. And benefits for them. Obviously there's huge benefits for young people to be involved in 
I say marine conservation, but any sort of conservation, any environmental activities, eco anxiety is a very real thing that people are suffering from, um, particularly in young people. I speak to my niece who's up in Manchester still. I was hoping she'd come and speak to us a little bit tonight, but she didn't in the end. I think, it, um, you know, she's 14. I think it intimidated her a little bit, but it's fine. She's aware of issues in conservation and environmental issues, and it does worry her. And actually, if you can bring them in and have them doing stuff, then it really counteracts that. It gives them a bit more of a hopeful feeling, doesn't it? like it does for us um i'm guessing anyway <laughs> and then obviously it's cv it looks great on their cv if they've got some volunteering on there job prospects and that's something that we've really harnessed as part of the beach rangers academy is we've put on that training for them to be able to put down on their cv that they've they, you know they've done this training and that training and it gives them that edge over other young people when it comes to job opportunities networking anything sort of environmental conservation based in Cornwall and I'm guessing the world it's a lot about who you know as well and it gives you really great opportunities to network with people training a lot of free training obviously we provide but they can do other training um, with different groups obviously around the coast general well-being I mean I think even if they don't know it I think spending time on or around the ocean is you know it massively improves well-being even if they wouldn't suspect it at first sorry uh sense of ownership as well you know if you give them that sense of ownership again that helps with that eco anxiety and a feeling of belonging like the picture of these two kids on say kids i shouldn't do that these young people on this photo are from um, a school in newquay and the school is actually they have a separate unit that they work with young people that don't necessarily just have um, learning difficulties. It's kids that are struggling in school in general, perhaps they don't quite fit in, they haven't managed to make many friends. So they get pushed together in this group and they end up making really strong friendships and they help each other bring themselves through secondary school, which I think I'm sure we can all remember how hideous secondary school could be when you were a teenager and you know they have that sense of belonging and then we saw this group grow from really shy individuals to a really strong gobby group of teenagers and it was brilliant you know that's what you want it was uh, it was ace so who do you want and where to find them obviously is always the big question so this is something I always go back to a lot, actually, and it's I think it's something hopefully you guys are familiar with. I'm sure you are. Um, so every young person, they have something to give and can benefit from engagement with us. We just have to recognise they have different capacity to care. And that's not necessarily meaning that, you know, they couldn't care about all environmental issues. But obviously, you know, there is a massive population of kids of young people and families who live um below the poverty line I think is the right way to say it. in poverty basically in Cornwall and obviously from the outskirts everyone thinks of Cornwall as being this beautiful you know holiday destination with big houses by the sea but for us who live there we know that that is very different to the reality of what it can be like for some people in Cornwall so the point is with that for me and with the, with the Maslow's hierarchy of needs, we can't expect a young person who's worried about where their next meal's coming from to, to really care too much about the environment. Doesn't mean that we can't necessarily get them there, but I think the way you go about getting them there is very different to how you go about if it was a young person who was financially stable and secure you know you can it's a different method you go about getting them to the same point if that makes sense so if you have a young person who's living in poverty you wouldn't automatically start selling them metal reusable bottles and be like you know you shouldn't use plastic water bottles this is what you should be using but if you can get them out to experience the ocean or the surrounding ocean uh, the surrounding area the coastline rock pools 
you're still giving them something. You're giving them something for themselves, which is lovely. You know, you might be giving them time away from a home that perhaps is unstable. And just being out there again, we've said about it improving well-being. And, you know, it's just giving them that, again, those ac that access to different opportunities that they might not already have. As we probably know a lot, of, you know, there's still a lot of young people and families that don't even visit the beach in Cornwall. Um, which for, for me is mind blowing being someone who's from Manchester and moved down here and, you know, wants to spend all my time on the beach, even when the weather's horrible, which I'm sure you guys are the same. <laughs> You're just like, this is incredible. So for them to be some families that don't place any value on that, but if we can give it some value for those young people, then that gives them a different relationship with it, aside from their sort of parents or guardians. And once our whole motto is about engage, inspire, protect. And we say that because obviously our hope is that we engage young people and communities with the marine environment to inspire them to protect it. And for me, the best way to do that is you show them, you show them how amazing it is and they're more likely to care about it. So that's why I refer to that. I always think Maslow's hierarchy of needs is a really a sort of have that underpinning everything that I think about and when it comes to sort of events and stuff and how it comes to shaping my sessions as well um, and how you sort of communicate about different environmental issues. So it's about knowing your audience um, and who you're trying to get involved. And I think that's a really good thing to remember as well is that a lot of young people who don't do well in school, labelled as naughty perhaps, tend to do well outside because you're taking them out of that system. I put the education system is flawed and again, that is not me bad mouthing teachers in any way because I hats off to them. I think they do an amazing job. Amazing is my favorite word in case people don't know that about me. So I'm sorry if I say it a lot, but I do say it a lot. Um, they do do an incredible job, but they'd be the first, they know there's a lack of funding, lack of time, and it's hard for them to think about getting those, those kids, those young people outside when they've got a very strict curriculum to sit stick to and they have to make sure they get everything covered but yeah with those naughty kids it's like again I refer to my nieces a lot my youngest niece is six and she is an absolute menace but she excels in so many other ways and the way her school deals with her is incredible because they really understand that she doesn't she doesn't fit the general mode of education. So they have put a lot of things in place for her, including rewards for when she is being good. And she's not a naughty kid. She's not a naughty kid. She just, she struggles to deal with her emotions. Basically when you tell her no, she flips a lid. <laughs> but she's not a naughty kid. And that's the thing, but you take her outside and she couldn't be happier. She loves looking at trees and butterflies and bees and everything. She finds nature incredible. And I think once you take those kids or young people outside of the classroom, as we experienced that day with the, the groups from Polter, their, their behaviour completely changed and they were fantastic. So ready-made groups, they are unfortunately they are easier and quicker to target. Obviously, I think that's the thing, obviously we can talk about working with the Your Show Network groups about engaging more young people. But as someone who has been doing that, but as a paid job for however many years I've been doing it, I'm also very aware of how difficult it is. And if you wanted to target a group quickly, then ready-made groups are great. So, Obviously, I've asked the question, where where can you find some good ready-made groups, do we think? If anyone would like to share some thoughts. Uh, you got the Cubs and Scouts the guides and things? Yes. <laughs> yeah. Just schools, teachers bringing together, you know, we're doing this activity. Can you bring together? You know, a lot of the careers activities that we run is that you've got a teacher that's interested or or it's it's on it's one of the things that they've got to tick and yeah. they okay, you want these within this 
age bracket or whatever and then there you go there's a group yeah yeah and I think that's awesome isn't it when you find that one teacher who gets it and it's like you you'll do what that's yeah let's do that that sounds great and that is very much part of the battle when you when I've been trying to get in touch with schools and stuff doing this job is sometimes if you just email the info at reception or whatever probably not going to hear anything back but if you can get a good contact it's yeah makes all the difference were you going to say something Jags? no that's cool I don't know where Joe is Joe still there the battery ran out she's just coming back in there oh bless her okay so yeah schools definitely so just thinking about pros and cons of schools um if anyone wants to chip in at any point go for it so pro wise like you said good ready-made groups what's great is as well is that you know it's always a mixed group you're gonna have kids in there that have had access to stuff and kids that don't again like we said if you could find that one teacher might be a few teachers that really get it then you know you've got a group there for life as long as as long as you keep giving them activities they're going to keep doing them um any more pros anyone wants to add with schools um it's kind of a captive audience almost <laughs> yeah depending on the age group it can be a really captive audience I think they've also got my kids are one at primary one at secondary school, but they also have direct communication links with the parents as well via newsletters and things like that. So you can get a wider hit, not just the youth, but you can then get onto the wider linkages to the schools as well. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah. Yeah. And like you were saying about the captive audience, Jax, like I've always, like, because obviously I've worked with the sort of previous to this, I worked with 16 to 18 year olds. Um, but like when I look at secondary schools, I really love <laughs> engaging with those sort of year sevens, eights, nines at a push. Once you get to year 10 and 11, that's when they get a little bit less captivated. <laughs> Not all the time. And a lot of what I'm saying can be quite a generalization, but obviously this is from my experience. But yeah, um, cons of school, again, is time constraints for schools. But as, and again, if you wanted to book onto Brenda's se session next week, that's sort of looking at linking your sessions with the curriculum, um, which is obviously a huge benefit to the school as well, because they are under such time constraints. But if you can target them that way, linking those sessions with the actual curriculum, like, you know, there's, there's elements of geography and science. I know I sent some information to you, Jeremy, but even the sort of citizenship um, or I think they, or morals and ethics, they call it, you know, that underpinning that is looking at them being, being better equipped to serve their community. So actually volunteering and working with community groups is a huge aspect of that. I think another, pro, another con, sorry for schools as well, actually, can be sometimes that, that mixture of whether they are engaged or not. Um, but we're going to look into that a bit more as well. So colleges obviously is another good ready-made group. Um, pros of colleges is definitely, I'd almost say they can be easier to target than schools. But again, that might just be from my experience, but I think it's because when you get to when you get to colleges, some of the courses that they offer are a bit more diverse than looking at school ages. So if you take St. Austell College, they have a course that's like foundation learning. So that's looking at equipping young people that um, perhaps wouldn't be well suited to sort of mainstream education, but they're equipping them in other ways. And that is when I've got links with the college and myself and Rob Wells, obviously from Three Bays Group. We've been in and given them talks about plastic and seals and they have a bit more capacity to, in, to be involved in that way. And also um, they have to do work experience as part of their college hours. So if, they, if you can offer them any volunteering, 
then college students again can be easy to access that way because they have a certain number of hours of learning they're supposed to do and having worked in the college I know that they struggle to well part of that is supposed to be work like work experience um so you can offer them training or actual placements um or they can do different sessions like is that's something that they're doing with the academy at the like starting to do at the minute because obviously no one's been able to go and do work experience due to this this whole pandemic business that we're in the middle of um any other pros for colleges from anyone i think some of them might have a bit more expertise so you can get more if you're doing a, a wildlife survey they might be able to be more competent at doing that so you can use it as a as data collection sort of. definitely and i've done some sure sure search surveys with the a-level student um well they don't do a levels there anymore uh, but a level students and stuff like you said they're a bit more expertise and they've also they've kind of in theory they've chosen what they wanted to do um in practice that's not always completely true because again with my previous job working at the college you know because you, they have to be in education learning or or sort of training until the age of 18 now you find a lot of young people that have kind of just been shoehorned into a a certain area or a certain a certain subject that they perhaps wouldn't have chosen but they don't really know what else to do that can make it quite difficult to engage them in anything including college um but again not completely their fault um any cons for colleges from anyone I say time sometimes I guess the same as schools yeah some pressures to get coursework and you know especially on the BTEC courses and things and I was just thinking across them well more schools than colleges but I guess I guess you covered it but it's that that thing where um you know a teacher might say yeah my group's well up for it let's do it but in reality it might not be and we're sort of battling with that at the moment like offering sort of work experience type type placements voluntary or that a teacher or a school volunteers their students to take part in it it's a very different experience <laughs> yeah definitely and I think sometimes you can change their minds can't you when they are kind of you know being that mopey teenager and it does happen <laughs> definitely does happen sometimes you can change their minds sometimes you can't and you know you've got to pick your battles but I can understand that must be really tricky to have an unmotivated young person doing work experience with you um I have to say I had I I was really I hadn't mentally prepared for a session I did once with um, some marine biology students who were college students who I was taking them rock pooling you'd think they would be all over rock pooling just and they most of them could not be less interested they were rude I was so shocked luckily there were some you know when you didn't expect it because you're like these are all marine biology students we're gonna get on really well they're gonna love rock pooling that wasn't the case but there were some other ones there that really loved rock pooling so we just got stuck in and you know, one girl didn't want to put a bag down and I think some of them ended up disappearing, which wasn't my fault. That was their uh, tutor's fault. So they had to deal with that. But yeah, it was uh, it was interesting. So, yeah, you, I suppose that's another thing you've got to learn. You can't you can't judge them by their course titles either because they can really shock you. Um, any other cons? I shall move on. I mean, I will say that actually, you know, if they are 16 plus, again, it's a generalization. They can have a lot more attitude than when you're dealing with a secondary school student. Um, but then that's obviously just knowing how to, to deal with them, which I do talk about communication in a little while. Obviously, universities, pro wise, again, is, I mean, definitely now they've chosen what they want to be doing. And I think you find that university students tend to come more to you than you really need to go to them. Uh, it doesn't, again, mean that they're all completely motivated. That <laughs> doesn't mean they're all completely motivated, but 
you'd expect them to be more motivated and they'd have more of those expertise. And again, a lot of students, like when I think about Nuki, they have to do some elements of work experience within their course. Um, so you can offer them sort of placements if there is any. Also, I know Jeremy, you were saying about the sort of, um, my words have just escaped me. So you're talking about those research topics, weren't you, for when you were saying about their third year projects and stuff like that is, you know, it's great because you're giving them, and I have passed on that information to the college, to the, the, the college, but the university students. Any pros from anyone for university students? Um, I was just going to say it's like uh, enthusiasm, but I, I feel that's double edged sword, really, because you've got their enthusiasm because they're choosing it and they want to learn and they're like sponges and that's fantastic. But having done a couple of freshers fairs where every single one of them sign up because they want to be a wildlife watch person and they love it. La, 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 it's all amazing. And then, you know, two weeks later, they found another 20 things that they'd like to be involved with. So the enthusiasm is fantastic. But I suppose it's just not to be disappointed if you then lose half yeah. of them or you only get a handful. But what I've found is that that handful can be absolutely dynamic and get you yeah. through the next three years. You know, a bit yeah. and I feel like that's it as well. It's knowing those other wins, isn't there? Like, like you said, you might, there might be a case that you have 20 people sign mm -hmm. up. But then, but then if you still end up with a core of even if it's just a couple, yeah, because there's a knock on effect as well, isn't there? If you get one person involved, they can create a ripple effect because they might. We were talking about this, I think Jax was in the same training as me, I'm not sure. We we're saying about you know, that can be worth that ripple effect can be worth mm -hmm. more than having someone sit in in a session mm -hmm. because if you've got one of your peers saying to you, I don't think you should be drinking out of that plastic bottle because of this. You'd probably be more likely, especially as a teenager, to take that advice and sort of want to fit in more with your peers. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the same for university students. Again, and that's what works well with the beach rangers is the fact that they are motivated, but there's one that is highly motivated and is really willing to give them all a kick if, they're being a bit slow to respond. So cons for universities. Again, I think time constraints for me is enough. In fact, sorry, did anyone else have any more pros? No. Cons, again, I think time constraints. Um, that can be quite difficult. And like you said, Joe, definitely the sort of drop off. I think the the pressures of well, it's same for schools and colleges, like we've said before, pressures of assignments, exams, having to fit it all in, transport for all of them, especially in somewhere like Cornwall, like the public transport isn't, you know, isn't great and not everyone can afford a car and we don't want everyone driving around in cars, even if they can. And um any more cons for universities? I think um, from our perspective, what we found with the local groups is obviously we're trying to engage young, local young people mm. and trying to get more local people involved in the local groups, particularly more local young people involved in local groups. And you're generally university students aren't local. Yeah. So we've got two partic like particularly two groups that really benefit from having a local student population but there's quite a high turnover with their groups as well. Yeah, yeah, and that's it. It can be like Nuki is such a transient place as someone who's lived there for 11 years now. And that, like you said, absolutely, you know, and same for Joe's, you're saying you had the volunteers who signed up for Wildlife Watch, but then a few years later, they've probably moved back home or somewhere else, <laughs> like hopefully some stay, but it can be, yeah, it can definitely be tricky. Yeah, I'm just going to add that th then I think the extra bit of work that's important with universities is to make sure that the, the work follows on and follows through so that they might be with you for three years and done exceptional work. But that in the last year, when, of course, they're under the most amount of pressure, we're then expecting them to then bring in the next year and, and so on. So 
the work I've done has been a lot of sort of uh, engagement and support around that, which has been really helpful. Um, yeah. and, and making it fun, you know, making it a break for them and stuff. So yeah. Yeah, saying. definitely. And I think that's what works well with FMC, with Farm of Marine uh, Conservation Group's outreach team, is they sort of pass the torch themselves. You know, so they they do their training and they go out into schools in Falmouth and they do their outreach program. But when it starts to get to them being in the third year, then they're looking for some some other sort of freshers to come in with that same passion and take over from them. So because that's another thing, third year, there's just. Yeah, it can't be done, can it? <laughs> and then obviously youth community, youth slash community organisations. Um. And for me, definitely pros with that is the fact that a lot of them, you know, they might be working with, oh, I've lost, I've lost my blanket. <laughs> they might be working with young people that are, are those young people that perhaps don't have access to the same opportunities, obviously, but when you get community and youth organisations, you include the clubs and scouts and stuff like that. Um, but then, you know, I think of organisations like, um, Thankfully, quite a few that Janine of has introduced me to, um, such as like Head Start, but then there's like Trellia down in Penzance, you know, and these are some of these are working with really vulnerable young people. And that is a real positive for me, because if you can get involved in these groups um, and offer them activities, not only will they bite your hand off for the activities, um, you're also giving something to young people that yeah again don't have the same access a lot of the time um and that's really really rewarding um it can it especially at the moment it's really hard at the moment because obviously everything is sort of so cut back because of of covid and people furloughed and obviously we can't do face-to-face -face engagement um and i think it it tends to be with those sort of, I think about Trello as an example, I very much have to keep on sort of going, hi, I'm, I'm here and I want, to, I want to work with you young people. And it's not that they don't want to work with me and they don't want their young people to work with me. Um, it's just time constraints for them. They're under a really, a lot of stress and they're working with, again, those really vulnerable young people. If you can get involved with them, but I understand as volunteers as well, that can be, Quite a daunting task and you don't have time you you know you're you're doing volunteer work in your spare time jeremy i don't know when you actually have spare time but apparently <laughs> apparently you managed to chair a group i don't know um so you might not be able to to access a group like that but if you can find those contacts which hopefully well which i can help with then it should be an easier sort of transaction if that makes sense um, so I kind of feel like I went through my pros and cons there for the youth groups. Has anyone got any pros or cons about you working with youth and community organisations you'd like to share? Um, the only other thing I was going to say, the word that keeps coming up for me is purpose and just giving young people a purpose. And, and like we've said, it may only be one or two, but hopefully more uh, throughout the year, but it a young person is so different when they have that, when they're grasping onto that, you know, they may have nothing else and certainly work with, with groups where, you know, there isn't a car, they can't get to the beach. And I think, you know, local charities are then supporting them, getting them coach loads to, to try it, but to actually have a purpose in their day is really helpful. Um, I think particularly as mental health issues are, are getting bigger and bigger and, you know, that's so important. It's uh, fantastic work really, which you keep doing. Yeah, I think, yeah, completely agree with you. And I think that was, it was something that always shocked me when I worked at the college and um, when I worked, because I worked a lot with sort of vulnerable, vulnerable young people and the sort of the amount of them that, you know, you'd be discussing different aspects and not to go in too in depth into it, but, you know, if there was issues around self-harm and stuff like that, and you'd, you'd be, I'd say to them, like, what do you do in your spare time? What could you, you know, and so many of them don't have hobbies. They don't have things that they're doing in their spare time. And actually, if we could be giving them stuff to do, 
like you said, giving them that sense of purpose, that can make such a huge difference to their lives. And I think it's the same for all ages as well. If, if you can become involved in a sort of group, um, like a community group, then actually, you know, it helps with loneliness and, you know, that sense, like you said, purpose, sense of belonging. And it's, you know, it's, it's a wonderful thing to be a part of for them. And it's just trying to build them up. So knowing that they can, can be part of it. Has anyone else got any pros or cons they want to add? I'll just say what I like about youth and community groups is they can be more sort of local, local. So you can be really local, specific. Um, and then you can do, say you were to plant a community woodland in a small village, those kids will then grow up without woodland and they'll see that every day. So that's quite a nice, nice thing you can have. It's more local, local. Yeah, definitely. Because that was something else when I worked at the college. Like it was in St. Austell, but you get kids that get the bus down from like up near Liscard and stuff. And you're like, oh, okay. That's a fair, when they need to go home at the end of the day, they have to go and get that bus, otherwise they're not getting back to their home. So yeah, no, you're totally right. Anything else anyone wants to add? Nope, I will move on. The how to communicate. So what do you think is the key to communicating with young people? Has anyone any thoughts? Maybe I should have clarified this at the start, but I think we all know, I, I hope that we do know when I refer to young people, I'm referring to 11 to 24 year olds. So if you're going to communicate with those, those people, those moody teenagers. <laughs> uh, gosh, I mean, I don't know about you, but in my house, there's a 16 year old and a 21 year old. And my goodness me, there's a language I don't even understand half the time. And, uh, and I think I've also learned is trying not to be cool trying not to use their language because it don't work and it doesn't sound good. And, and I think just being genuine, you know, that some are going to like you and some aren't. And that's just how it is. But ultimately you're there as a role model and, you know, yeah. communication is so important, but yeah, I've given up. It's, I don't know what they're talking about half the time. <laughs> I'd say if they're in your house, you're not supposed to know what they're talking about. <laughs> They're probably talking about you. <laughs> I know, in a really, as a stepmom, in a really bad way, you know, because I'm not their mom. But uh, yeah, it's it's been an eye opener for me to see what yeah. you know and how a 16 year old communicates now. So different to when I was 16. So yeah. much time online and by so much texting and you know. Yeah. And, and messaging on countless different social media platforms. Yeah, so many platforms. <laughs> Jake, Jake's got probably four or five on the go at all the time. And wow. it's quite incredible. <laughs> I, can't, yeah, I, don't, I, I can't keep up, but yeah, a really interesting one. And it's changed so much in the last 10 years, I think. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And I think you're totally right as well when you say it's, you don't try and use what their, their lingo. Mm. because it is it's you know my dad still does <laughs> my dad still does it to me and I'm a grown-up and sometimes I'm like oh dad shut up <laughs> ah. <laughs> although he does say that I shouldn't say awesome as much as I do because oh. he doesn't think a sandwich can be awesome <laughs> and I'm like that was an awesome sandwich it wasn't awesome oh um, so <laughs> But yeah, no, totally. And being genuine is hugely important. Anything else? Anyone else got any thoughts about communicating with young people? I was just thinking about sort of listening to what young people want from, from the group or from an activity or whatever. I, I don't know. You know, lots of people develop activities because they think that's what young people want or need. And yeah. Has anybody asked a young person? Do, do yeah. that's true? Or is that just what what we think in our heads? Because um, you know, when I was sixteen, I I didn't you know I didn't I didn't want any involvement. No, I agree. I totally agree. And that's the thing I talk about um, working with sort of moody teenagers or whatever. But I was a moody teenager. I was awful. I was one of those that my mum had that conversation with me of. I love you because I have to, but I don't like who you are. Like, you know, I was that teenager. So I thought, I'm like, I'm looking at it from that. I'm like, I was that person that was really uncommunicative. 
um not through social media though but yeah I was I was a pain um and trying to get them involved in planning and activities is if you can get them involved in that way then you're definitely winning um I know at the beginning of my role I tried to run a community events I think it would actually work now that we're more of an established project and I wonder if perhaps because it was early days in the project that it didn't work as well but it was called communicating Con conservation and I wanted to have a conversation with young people in the areas that we were targeting to find out what they wanted from us as a project and I, I ran the first one in Bude and there was very few young people that showed up and then I think the next one was in Penzance and there was even less um so it was a lesson learned and that's you know but I think if you can get them in a group or target them somehow to tell you what they want then definitely you're definitely winning any other thoughts I will move on so yeah so obviously getting them involved from the offset social media is as we all know hugely important Something I was thinking of from the beach ranger's perspective is almost like a legacy aspect is even if it's a beach ranger that isn't perhaps completely local to the groups, perhaps we could link up a beach ranger with the groups in the community as almost like a, what's the word, as an advisor almost. Like I even, again, the same beach ranger who gives other beach rangers a, a respond to Jen poke for me. I've also asked his advice in the past about different things that I'm planning and said, you know, what do you think about this? Do you think, do you think it'll work? And it's really helpful to have a young person's perspective on it. Um, and things like social media, I think that could be something that a beach ranger could really help groups with the use of social media. If they, you know, if there was something we wanted, because it is, it's how they communicate you know, we're now, because we have a project apprentice, really good on Facebook, Twitter, although Jax was already really good on Twitter and Instagram. We weren't before we had a project apprentice. That was something we really had to build up. And we know really, if we had longer left on the project, we'd move on to things like TikTok somehow, because these are the, the social media platforms that are coming through now. Um, even though I still don't really know what TikTok is, but I know that young people love it. Uh, so if you can get on social media platforms like that, it's going to massively help you communicate with young people because, you know, they're going to be on there. <laughs> and think about your target audience when shaping your event. One size does definitely not fit all. And split the age group down. So when I say that, so obviously I target 11 to 24 year olds and same for you, Joe, you're saying you've got a 16 year old and a 21 year old in the same house. If I try to shape an event for them both, there's no way it would work. Like even that, well, I mean, it is a big age back bracket, isn't it? I know, again, a generalization, but generally speaking, a 21 year old isn't gonna wanna be at the same event as a 13 year old, not no, all the time. Not unless there's squirty cream. That's the only time I've been able to get them to do the same thing at the same time. Just saying. <laughs> Just say, so if we can involve some squirty cream, then they'll maybe we could make like pancakes with squirty cream, like like draw crabs on them and stuff. I don't know. Have like a marine themed breakfast brunch meeting. Maybe that's how we could get them together to talk about what they want to do for environmental things. You know, interestingly, there's a group. So I'm Bodmin Way, and there's a lot of uh, groups going on with uh, children in poverty, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And one of them, Nick Elvey, amazing woman, Curious School of the Wild. She does like a soup club and an outdoor cooking club, and that is absolutely incredible because not only does it bring kids together that really aren't eating that well, but it's yeah together they're learning amazing skills they're also being fed um yeah. and they want to be there not just because it's food but because they're part of something and they and they've made something and she's done incredible work actually and it and we joke about food in groups where we're older and going oh we love a bit of tea and cake but wow you know you give the kids something they love they're there you yeah. know outdoor cooking all of that yeah yeah we we did some some activity days with Cornwall Marine Network. They work a lot with young people who 
are sort of disengaged and a bit lost. They don't know where they what they want to do education or training wise. So we ran some activity days to do some marine stuff with them, took them snorkeling, obviously, an excuse for me and Jax. Um, like, let's go for a snorkel. Um, but we also did some foraging and some wild cooking with them as well. And um, yeah, as you said, really, really enjoyed it. And that's something else, you know, whenever I, if I'm working with any of the young people down at Trellia, I always make sure I've got snacks and a cup of soups and hot drinks with them. So after we've done the activity, we can have a bit of a bit of a feed um, before we send them home. Um, and I think, you know, if you are going to have any sort of event where you target young people, if it's indoors, like we've had movie nights and stuff, get pizza like everyone they all, it's like have some pizza come and watch a film okay that sounds great um so yeah food goes a long way uh, but it does for me i must admit if someone says there's free food somewhere i am i'm there like a shop um so yeah so you've got to think about that you've got to think about the different age groups when you're targeting and planning your events uh, one of my and i know that i do jacks i don't think i well i do jacks is in with it um, thinking about the titles for events and sessions because one thing I hate and I hate the name of it even though I love what you're actually doing is rock pool rambles I mean what young person is going to sign up for a rock pool ramble but well, I take them rock pool in that sounds better <laughs> or you know we've called it things like explore the shore but a rock pool ramble to me sounds like you're either going to be a, a tiny little kid or that okay. tiny little kid's grandparent who has taken them for a rock ball ramble. That takes us back to like the communication thing and about different ages. So it's the older people. So for example, in Pose F, we were much older creating something that thought, oh, rock ball ramble sounds fabulous, you know. But like you say to a little one, rock ball safari was moving yeah. towards the right way. But rock balling, that's what it is. That's what we're yeah. going to do. Kids love it. Yeah, it's, it's and you don't realise. In fact, I'm horrified how many times we use that word. The rock pool, you know, ramble, but yeah. And I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not young. Maybe, maybe it's changed now. Maybe the young, the well, young younger people. than me. I was <laughs> say, I'm like, oh, 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 I don't, I don't want to go for a rock pool ramble. Um, so yeah, think about your titles for the events and sessions. It's something I've been guilty of in the past before as well. Is it's hard because you're trying to think of like a, a, a funky name for something, but you also don't want to lose the meaning of the event because if it's too ambiguous then they're not going to know what they're signing up for. So they're not going to sign up. Um, but yeah, you want to try and be a bit creative and that can make it, it can make it quite tricky. So, you know, just rock pooling is fine. Or we do radical rock pools, which is obviously, again, I'm, it's, a, it's a catchy title. I'm not quite convinced of the word radical um, because, you know, yeah, I don't know. But I think it does fit the event. And actually, we do get a lot of young people that sign up for it. And that's getting in the rock pools with a mask, snorkel and wetsuit. So it's just a bit more of a progression from rock pooling. Because I, I think rock pooling itself can be something that you can be into when you're younger. Perhaps you might lose the passion for it as a teenager. And then you might come back to it. Again, I have been with groups of teenagers and we've gone rock pool and they, they've absolutely loved it. Um, so I suppose it just depends how you pitch it but a lot of them you know a lot of teenagers really just like a good beach clean as well if you can get them involved because again they're feeling like they're doing something really environmentally purposeful um, and they feel like they're helping and a beach clean is always always a good one so once you have them so this is sort of my tips for when you actually have a group of young people and I will I'm just checking the time because I will we are nearly there and then feel free to ask any questions. So have a sense of humour. Obviously, some of these might sound a bit obvious, but you do need to have a sense of humour. And you can't, you can't take their sometimes slightly off attitude badly or personally. I'm not saying that I've never taken a bad attitude badly, because I have. But it's also then knowing how to deal with them if they are being sort of grumpy. And um, one thing, I'll be totally honest, one way that I tend to try and win them around is, is having that, and I hate this word, but having that banter. Being a bit cheeky. Was, I've always been quite cheeky, and I think that lets me get away with a lot of stuff that other people 
that most people get away with. If you could do it with a smile, then most of the time you're okay if you're a bit cheeky. But you've got to listen and be respectful because they do want to be heard and they want to be involved. But obviously that respect does work both ways. Um, but don't, don't expect just because you're an adult that they are going to be respectful to you. Um, I know that's kind of definitely how, you know, that's how I was brought up, that if you were with an adult, you were respectful regardless. And I know a lot of, a lot of kids are brought up exactly the same way, but when you're in a group of teenagers, that doesn't necessarily mean they're going to remember that when they're, when they're in your session. So, but don't forget that you're taking them, you might be taken away from their norm. So, you know, again, we talk about those naughty kids uh, who will be completely different once you're doing that. And something that really changes behavior is if you get them in the sea, because that really shows, that's when, you know, so many of them feel a lot more vulnerable if you take them in the ocean, because it's, for a lot of them, it's unfamiliar. And that's when we've seen massive changes in behavior but then, you know, with different activity days I've run and stuff with young people, you can get them on side because you are taking them away from their norm. So if you're not trying to be cool, and like you said, Joe, like using their lingo with them, most of the time they think you're quite cool anyway because you're not their teacher, you're not their parent, you're someone who's talking to them as another human being and showing them some cool stuff. But don't be intimidated by them and be strong one thing that I always do and it's 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 hard to advise this because actually really it's not very professional but if I'm in a group of 12 teenagers say and they're being disrespectful and they're talking when I'm trying to talk I did it when I was a teacher as well at the college I have no qualms about telling them to shut up and that is language that you kind of get told as a teacher not to use but as a teacher, the language you're told to use is, well, to kind of go quiet and wait for them to realise that you're waiting for them to, and then they'll stop talking. And then if <laughs> it doesn't work, it can work. It can probably work with younger kids. But with a group of 16 year olds, when I was teaching my motor vehicle students, if I had just stood there quietly waiting for them to be quiet, they would have never, ever shut up. And again, if you can do it with a bit of a smile, and I think it's that, you know, you do get a response sometimes where they go, I can't believe you just said that. And you're like, well, shut up or pipe down and do it with the action. I always enjoy it, shush, pipe down, shush. But don't be intimidated by them. You need to tell them when they need to listen to you. And I've also threatened them to not be able to come on my sessions before as well. I've had no qualms about saying, if you don't shut up and listen, don't think you're coming in the sea with me because it's dangerous. Um, don't go too over the top with facts, Latin names. Obviously, Mr. Matt Slater, who I love daily, who we work with, he knows all the Latin names for all the animals. But most of the time they're not bothered and they don't want all that information. If they do, you'll get some that might and they'll be really into it. Generally speaking, most of them not bothered. And tell them which crab that is. Tell them some funky facts about crabs. Tell them there's, you know, the silly facts like the barnacles having the biggest penis in the animal kingdom in comparison to the body size. You know, they love facts like that because it's funny, but keep it basic and keep the facts light. And make sure you tell them, if you're talking about environmental issues, tell them what they can do to make a difference. You don't want, I think that obviously feeds in a lot to eco-anxiety as well. If you're just telling them how hideous everything is and it does it for all of us, I think, you need to know what you can actually do to make a difference. Otherwise you can feel quite powerless and we want to empower them and make them feel heard and important. Give them that ownership and make it fun. That is really important. And obviously sometimes when you are being a bit bossy, you'd say trying to get them to listen to you, it can take some of the fun away, but you can definitely get that fun back. Um, so yeah, there, there's some of my top tips. Uh, safeguarding. Now we have, potentially we can put on a safeguarding, but it's a full day online course. So people are very welcome to do it. And um, that will be with Pete from Young People Cornwall. But we're also aware that doing a full online training day can be quite a lot. 
But if you are interested, obviously, I was going to say speak to Jax, but you'll need to speak to Joe <laughs> and myself. Um, but obviously, it's a huge, huge topic, and it can be longer than a one-day session. Um, in my previous role, I am safeguarded trained to the level three um, because of the, the nature of the role that I was doing. But for now, here's some pointers. Don't make any physical contact with them which sounds really dramatic and drastic, but it's true. Don't touch them. If you, if they need help, I've done it before, you know, if you're going onto some rock pools and you can see someone struggling, you can offer a hand. Obviously not at the minute you can't, but we're not rock pooling with anyone at the minute. But do not just grab their arm. Do not take their hand. Um, I had an awful moment when I worked at the college with a, a girl who I'd helped Basically, she wasn't enjoying a course. I found out what course she really wanted to be doing. She wasn't sure whether she should. And she changed course and she was much happier. She gave me a card to say thank you at the end of the year. And she really wanted to give me a hug. I wanted to hug her, but I had to say no. And she understood. But it's it's awful, but it's true. Uh, get a DBS check if you plan to work with them, obviously. And we do provide... Oops. Do not allow yourself to be alone with a young person. Um, and you shouldn't be, if you're working as a volunteer, you shouldn't ever really be alone with a young person anyway. Um, remember that you are taking about the norm. So the reason why I put that in there is because something that we sort of learned about is the fact that because you're taking them out of that normal environment, you might be just chatting to them about something entirely different. But if they've sort of looking at you as a bit of a role model like joe said and you're getting on well you're just having a nice conversation young people can be quite likely to disclose things to you they wouldn't necessarily disclose to someone else and that can be the fact that because they do look at, up to you and they've kind of formed they can form quite a quick bond with you as well when you're doing different activities but also sometimes it's because they predict that you won't know what to do with that information so just be aware of your like if you are in that sort of situation and just be sure to let somebody know um if you felt comfortable with it you could try and have a conversation with them that can be difficult because obviously you don't really want to be alone with that young person and to have that conversation it would be better to be alone um but if they were to disclose something to you that you felt needed they probably needed help with you are able to sort of say to them you know do you not think you should speak to someone else that you trust about this um whatever you do don't cut them off and don't shut them down don't stop them talking because they might not speak to anybody else <laughs> but you can try and encourage them to do so i know that sounds quite scary i always kind of hate talking about safeguarding but it is it is so hugely important and if you do notice out anything out of the ordinary let someone know um, I mean, if you're with a school group, say the teachers should be aware of different things and, you know, but just keep your eye out for stuff. You know, I've had experiences where you've seen behavior that just seems slightly not what you've expected. And if you are with a teacher, you can speak to the teacher about it quietly on the side. And remember that if there is anything that comes up, I am here to help and advise with anything like that as well. But Generally speaking, you won't find yourself in those situations. Um, so just real quick, obviously, from my previous um, conferences, these are things that were raised. So teaching techniques was something that was mentioned that perhaps it was something we could help support with. And what can I say? I can say about, I mean, I did my, I've done my PGC, I am a qualified teacher. And I think a lot of the time with teaching techniques, I can give you lesson plans and like quick lesson plans. Um, I can talk to you about putting presentations together, but all the time with actual teaching, it's just, and that's something that shocked me when I did my PGC is the fact that you get put in a classroom straight away and you're teaching. And it's about doing it and building up that confidence and learning which ways work for you and which don't. Learning that some groups don't respond well if you just go quiet and you're waiting for them to, to be quiet so you can carry on with your session. Um, but any help with anything like that, do just give me a shout. Something that was brought up as well was about starting a conversation with a young person. 
So, I mean, how would you start a conversation with a young person? Anyone got any thoughts about that? <laughs> like you would with anybody else, wouldn't you? Like, you know, hi, I'm Janine, you know. I'd be a bit nervous because you, you, you're in the same situation as them, aren't you? You know, like, I, I don't know. I, I just, just jump in. Yeah, you're totally right. That's exactly what I do because they are just human beings, aren't they? And I think it is like we were saying before about being genuine. You just say hi. Hi, how's it going? Do you want to look at this crab? You know, got this crab. It's pretty cool. You might be like, yeah, it's all right. Like, what other things are you like then? I don't know. Like you said, you just got to be genuine and just speak to them as a normal person. I did when I was speaking to my 14 year old niece about this training. I was like, some people are frightened of your age group. And she was like, why? I'm like, I don't know. <laughs> but they are. <laughs> but she's not scary at all. Bless her. Um, and yes, you do work in different circles, but that's completely fine. And you wouldn't necessarily bump into these young people. Um, but it doesn't mean that you can't interact with them when you are face to face with them. Um, you won't get through to everyone, as I said, but that's OK. If you can get a few wins and you get a few ones on board, just change it again, creating those light bulb moments and changing some minds and perspectives. You know, that's a win. If you've got a group of 10 and two of them have come out and they've, you know, really taken on board some of the stuff you said, you know, I don't, that's, it's amazing. Obviously you want all, all 10 of them, and but it doesn't always happen that way. And transport is an issue, but if you're working with schools and colleges and some youth organizations as well, they do tend to have some transport. Um, not all the time, um, it can be quite difficult, but there is a lot of transport that they can use. Someone had said as well about an events pack. Adele had put together an events pack. I don't know if it was something, do you remember it, Jeremy? Adele's events pack. Yeah, I, I, I remember I got a copy somewhere. I think it was on your website to download or something like that at a time. I think it's... Yeah, no, that's cool. It's still there and you know we could possibly update it as well. And just to make you aware as well, at the moment we are working on a very sort of extensive document with all different contacts. And we're looking at, as you can probably see from there, which local group is their, their closest and possible link up and then what their sort of involvement has been with us. Um, and obviously, Jeremy, we spoke about, and I've not forgotten that we're gonna try and set up some sessions, online sessions for you to kind of introduce the group to some of the schools and stuff. So. We'll be pushing that again this side of the new year, but yes, the fingers crossed. Um, so we're gonna work on and carry on working on creating those links. Now I've got a little video to watch, but I'm aware that it's quarter past eight. So what I might do first is do, if anyone's got any questions, and then if not, we'll, or yeah, we'll see what time and, and maybe watch this video. Anyone got any questions? Sorry, I hope that was useful as well. I hope there was some good points on there. <laughs> I've got some questions, not a long list, don't worry. <laughs> you sound like you, Jeremy. <laughs> um, I, I've not had the experience yet of having to deal with some of the care anxiety. I'm just curious what what examples you've had and, and how you've dealt with it, Jen. Um, I'm trying to think of a specific example. I mean, I think it, it's not always necessarily that they sort of announce themselves as having, but it's, it's quite a general theme amongst a lot of young people now, I'd say. So, you know, they're really almost hyper aware of, of environmental issues. The group that I worked with um, at Trotheris, you know, they're young people when we done sort of, we did a beach clean, but we walked down from the school down to Porth Beach and all along in the bushes, there was loads of rubbish. We were cleaning as we went. Our buckets were full before we'd even got to the beach. And I think, you know, having those conversations, they are so aware of what this, you know, the problems with plastic and yeah, just all sort of environmental issues that it's something that is a constant worry amongst everything else they've got. 
simmering there's that worry about the environment you know because it is quite common knowledge now and they're aware that they are a generation that people are almost looking to to take the mantle and I think for me it's giving them giving them the tools so training but actually getting them out and getting them doing beach cleans and talking to them about different things they can do and giving them that sort of empowerment that does make a difference I mean and look at all those young people that were at the the school strikes you know they're obviously highly aware of what's going on and they're really sort of pushing for people to for the government to start making a difference so I don't know if I really answered your question Jeremy can I can I add something in there as well because something that we work with schools with as part of the Head Start team who support young people with well-being, but just eco anxiety is just like any other kind of anxiety, and almost can be if treated probably not the right word, but in that in that similar way that you treat any other anxiety. So so taking positive action is mm. is a really good way, but focusing on the negatives, you know, like it's really bad and we've only got, you know, so many years and the carbon and ah, uh, you know, that, that can be really debilitating for all of us. But actually saying, look, we can, we can make a difference. Look how much rubbish we've collected and we've made a difference to these beaches. And actually that whole beach clean movement, we have seen a difference on our beaches across Cornwall. It's made a massive impact to, you know, and, all, and also something that I'm always reminded about when I did my environmental degree, God knows how long ago, you know, we had huge problems with um, pollution from cars and, and things like that. We still got those problems, but they're less. They're getting, yeah. you know, they've got better over time, haven't they? You know, so yeah, uh, we try and focus on on those positives and, and any other ways that you deal with anxiety. So. Thanks, Janine. I've got, I've got another question. If that's right. Yeah. Uh, um, the sort of top age bracket, I think is like 23 to 24 you deal with. Um, uh, just if you've got any success or experience with that, that age bracket, because I think, again, that's another whole different sort of that these people generally out of education or out of a system. So they're harder to find, hopefully, in, in employment. And again, in Cornwall, there's possibly less, less, I'm not quite sure in the demographic figures, possibly less around or harder to communicate with, I'm not sure. I just wonder if you had any experience with the, the older sort of bracket of young people. I must say my my general experience with that age gra bracket is more of the mature students that you get in the universities. Um, trying to think about, there has been some young people that I've worked with, with sort of groups like Cornwall Marine Network that have been that sort of age bracket and that have, they're struggling to find their path work-wise or education or training or whatever um I think like you said yeah I think you're right I think they're they're a really tricky age group because they're not necessarily in a ready-made group um and might be feeling a little bit lost no I, I mean as, as a mother hat is obviously I'm an employer and I've got some of those people in my age group that work for me as well and I you know and it's, it's trying to think well the only way I can get it if from a business point of view if I install that into some sort of team training or something else to as, as, a, as a responsible employer to, to get them to think about that that was the only example I can think of, of how I could could engage with them is, is through that because a they'll possibly get paid or we can put it part of our training um mm -hmm. Uh, and they can get a reward out of it and make it fun at the same time. And that could instill, you know, them to be more productive and, and have better ideas in the future, really. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah. Yeah, no good ideas. Any other questions? From anyone? Cool. Oh, we'll watch this video then quick before. This is... You might have already seen it, some of you, but I always, I absolutely love this. And it's something I find it's really, hopefully you'll agree with me, really thought provoking, um, thinking about the sort of education system and how we sort of work with young people within the education system. So we'll give it a watch and hopefully it'll all work okay. Can you hear it okay? Can't 
hear i can just see your the slide of your presentation is the video not on there no well that's weird isn't it i'll tell you what i'll go i'll stop sharing a moment and, and when share. you when you share screen there should be an option to share computer audio as well and what i'll do is because i Share computer sound. Thank you, Jax. You know so much. So hopefully. Can you see that now? See the hand, it's not moving. That's fine, that's okay. Weird though, because it's not our uh, area. There you go. Every country on earth at the moment is reforming public education. There are two reasons for it. The first of them is economic. People are trying to f work out how do we educate our children to take their place in the economies of the 21st century? How do we do that? Given that we can't anticipate what the economy will look like at the end of next week, as the recent turmoil is demonstrating. How do we do that? The second, though, is cultural. Every country on Earth, on Earth is trying to figure out how do we educate our children so they have a sense of cultural identity and so that we can pass on the cultural genes of our communities while being part of the process of globalization. How do we square that circle? The problem is they're trying to meet the future by doing what they did in the past. And on the way, they're alienating millions of kids who don't see any purpose in going to school. When we went to school, we were kept there with a story, which is if you worked hard and did well, and got a college degree, you would have a job. Our kids don't believe that. And they're right not to, by the way. You're better having a degree than not, but it's not a guarantee anymore. And particularly not if the route to it marginalizes most of the things that you think are important about yourself. Some people say we have to raise standards as if this is a breakthrough. You know, like, really, yes, I, we should. Why would you lower them? You know, I, mean, I, I haven't come across an argument that persuades me of lowering them. But raising them, of course we should raise them. The problem is that the current system of education was designed and conceived and structured for a different age. It was conceived in the intellectual culture of the Enlightenment and in the economic circumstances of the Industrial Revolution. Before the middle of the 19th century, there were no systems of public education. Not really. I mean, you could get educated by Jesuits, you know, if, if you had the money. But public education, paid for from taxation, compulsory to everybody and free at the point of delivery, that was a revolutionary idea. And many people objected to it. They said it's not possible for many street kids, working class children, to benefit from public education. They're incapable of learning to read and write, and why are we spending time on this? So there's also built into it a whole series of um, assumptions about social structure and capacity. It was driven by an economic imperative of the time but running right through it um, was an intellectual model of the mind, which was essentially the Enlightenment view of intelligence. That real intelligence consists in this capacity for a certain type of deductive reasoning and a knowledge of the classics originally, what we come to think of as academic ability. And this is deep in the gene pool of public education, that there are really two types of people, academic and non-academic, smart people and non-smart people. And the consequence of that is that many brilliant people think they're not because they've been judged against this particular view of the mind. So we have a, a twin pillars, economic and intellectual. And my view is that this model has caused chaos in many people's lives. It's been great for some. There have been people who have benefited wonderfully from it. But most people have not. Instead, they suffer this. This is the modern epidemic, and it's as misplaced and it's as fictitious. This is the plague of ADHD. Now, this is a map of the instance of ADHD in America, or prescriptions for ADHD. Don't mistake me here. I don't mean to say there is no such thing as attention deficit disorder. I'm not qualified to say if there is such a thing. I know that a great majority of psychologists and, and pediatricians think there is such a thing. But it's still a matter of, dis of debate. What I do know for a fact is it's not an epidemic. These kids are being medicated as routinely as we had our tonsils taken out. 
And on the same whimsical basis, and for the same reason, medical fashion. Our children are living in the most intensely stimulating period in the history of the Earth. They're being besieged with information and calls for their attention from every platform, computers, from iPhones, from advertising holdings, from hundreds of television channels. And we're penalizing them now for getting distracted. From what? You know, boring stuff <laughs> at school, for the most part. It seems to me it's not a coincidence, totally, that the incidence of ADHD has risen in parallel with the growth of standardized testing. Now, these kids are being given Ritalin and Adderall and all manner of things, often quite dangerous drugs, to get them focused and calm them down. But according to this, attention deficit disorder increases as you travel east across the country. People start losing interest in Oklahoma. <laughs> They can hardly think straight in Arkansas. And by the time they get to Washington, they've lost it completely. And there are separate reasons for that, I believe. <laughs> it's a fictitious epidemic. If you think of it, the arts, and I don't say this exclusively the arts, I think it's also true of science and of maths, but let me, I say about the art particularly because they are the victims of this mentality currently, particularly. The arts, especially address the idea of aesthetic experience. An aesthetic experience is one in which your senses are operating at their peak, when you're present in the current moment, when you're resonating with the excitement of this thing that you're experiencing, when you are fully alive. An anesthetic is when you shut your senses off and deaden yourself to what's happening. And a lot of these drugs are that. We're getting our children through education by anesthetizing them. And I think we should be doing the exact opposite. We shouldn't be putting them asleep. We should be waking them up to what they have inside of themselves. But the model we have is this. It's, I believe we have a system of education that is modeled on the interests of industrialism and in the image of it. I'll give you a couple of examples. Uh, schools are still pretty much organized on factory lines, uh, ringing bells, separate facilities. Uh, specialized into separate subjects. Um, we still educate children by batches. You know, we put them through the system by age group. Why do we do that? You know, why is there this assumption that the most important thing kids have in common is how old they are? You know, it's like the most important thing about them is their date of manufacture. You know what I mean? Well, I know kids who are much better than other kids at the same age in different disciplines, you know, or at different times of the day or better in smaller groups than in large groups, or sometimes they want to be on their own. If you're interested in the model of learning, you don't start from this production line mentality. These are, it's essentially about conformity, and increasingly it's about that as you look at the growth of standardized testing and standardized curricula, and it's about standardization. I believe we've got to go in the exact opposite direction. That's what I mean about changing the paradigm. There was a great study done recently of divergent thinking published a couple of years ago, divergent thinking isn't the same thing as creativity. I define creativity as the, the process of having original ideas that have value. Divergent thinking isn't a synonym, but it's a, an essential capacity for creativity. It's the ability to see lots of possible answers to a question, lots of possible ways of interpreting a question, uh, to think what Edward de Bono would probably call laterally, uh, to think not just in linear or convergent ways, uh, to see multiple answers, not one. So, I mean, there are tests for this. I mean, one kind of cod example would be, people might be asked to say, how many uses can you think of for a paperclip? One well, of those routine questions. Most people might come up with 10 or 15. People who are good at this might come up with 200. And they do that by saying, well, could the paperclip be 200 foot tall and be made out of foam rubber? You know, like, does it have to be a paperclip as we know it, Jim? You know. Um, now, the test for this, and they gave them to 1,500 people. This is in a book called Breakpoint and Beyond. And on the protocol of the test, if you scored above a certain level, you'd be considered to be a genius at divergent thinking. Okay? So my question to you is, what percentage of the people tested, of the 1,500, scored at genius level for divergent thinking? Now, you need to know one more thing about them. These were kindergarten children. So what do you think? What percentage at genius level? 80. 80. 80, okay. 98%.
Now, the thing about this was it was a longitudinal study. So they retested the same children five years later, age of eight to ten. What do you think? Fifty? They retested them again five years later, ages uh, 13 to 15. You can see a trend here, can't you? <laughs> now, this tells an interesting story. Because you could have imagined it going the other way. Can you? You start off not being very good, but you get better as you get older. But this shows two things. One is we all have this capacity. And two, it mostly deteriorates. Now, a lot of things have happened to these kids as they've grown up. A lot. But one of the most important things that happened to them, I'm convinced, is that by now, they've become educated. They, you know, they've spent 10 years at school being told there's one answer, it's at the back. And don't look. And don't copy, because that's cheating. I mean, outside schools, that's called collaboration. You know, but <laughs> inside schools. Now, this isn't because teachers want it this way. It's just because it happens that way. Um, it's because it's in the gene pool of education. We have to think differently about human capacity. We have to get over this old conception of academic, non-academic, abstract, theoretical, vocational, uh, and see it for what it is, um, a myth. Uh, secondly, we have to recognize that most great learning happens in groups, that collaboration is the stuff of growth. If we atomize people and separate them and judge them separately, we form a kind of disjunction between them and their natural learning environment. And thirdly, it's crucially about the culture of our institutions, the habits of the institution and the habitats that they occupy. Right. <laughs> I just, I don't know if any of you have seen that video before, but I, I just uh, absolutely love it. And I think it's very true. And like he said about, it's not the education system's fault, but yeah, it's all time. It's time, isn't it? It's time. And what he's saying sounds ideal, but putting into practice, I can imagine it'd be quite difficult. But I do know there is some schools that are sort of going about it more that sort of way as well, which is nice to see a shift. So does anyone, because obviously I know that we're slightly overrun, so has anyone got anything else you'd like to add or anything before we head off? I just like, just that, that was a really nice video. I'm going to use that myself. Um, but I think that um, that's what, uh, you know, groups and community groups, like what you're doing, that's what it offers young people who don't fit in that system that we've built um, to be able to recognize, because it's it's not just about doing some rock pooling, it's about all of those things that you mentioned at the beginning that we give to young people when, we, when they take part in those activities. So it's allowing them to see value outside of, you know, I didn't get an A, you know, I'm not an A star student, it doesn't matter, it's so much more. Yeah, really good, thank you. Collaboration, great. <laughs> Love it. Yeah, no, that's great. And like you said, totally right. And what was brilliant is with help of the sort of the projects and the Beach Rangers Academy training, there was a group at Bodmin College who were a post-16, not in their in education still, but it's more about that sort of foundation learning. And thanks to the sort of intervention with the academy, they've now made Bodmin College like an eco school and stuff. Like you know, because they've they've really taken it all on board. And like you said, it's given them that sort of ownership and place in the value somewhere, somewhere. Jake goes there. <laughs> I didn't know that. So that's fantastic. <laughs> Yay. The, the communication Yay. isn't working that well now, I don't think, but everything else is good. <laughs> yeah, brilliant. Thank you, Jen. Thank you. <laughs> That's cool. Awesome. Well, thank you guys. Thanks for joining us. And hi, hi Ian. Nice to see you. <laughs> nice to see you. And uh, I'll see you guys soon, hopefully, maybe in person or probably online. <laughs> yeah, thanks guys. And don't forget we've got another two sessions coming up the next two Tuesdays. But yeah, thank you very much. Thanks. Bye. Thank you very much. Bye. Thanks, Janine. Thanks. Really nice to see you.